Hi, this is Dr. Kat Fies from Central New Mexico Community College. Phew, we've reached the last video on the urinary system. Let's take a look finally at how we are capable of excreting a dilute urine, meaning a very watery urine, versus a very concentrated urine, meaning a urine that does not have as much water in it. So remember from the previous video, the filtrate that enters into the distal convoluted tubule is going to be hypotonic to the blood. It's only going to be at 100 milliosmoles, while our blood that enters or leaves the kidneys is always at 300 milliosmoles. If, on the other hand, antidiuretic hormone is secreted, we can change this osmolality of 100. So that's kind of the goal of this last video. Another piece of information to remind you of is that collecting ducts, they are impermeable to water unless we have ADH present. Now, sodium and some other ions can be removed from our um, distal convoluted tubule and even collecting ducts, but again, that requires hormones such as, for instance, aldosterone or parathyroid hormone. Consequently, if that happens, if these additional ions are removed by either active and passive mechanisms and the help of hormones, of course, we can actually excrete a urine that is extremely dilute it can go down to 50 milliosmoles. That's one-sixth the osmolality of the plasma, so a very watery urine. In contrast, in case antidiuretic hormone is available and it can bind to the cells of the distal convoluted tubules and the collecting ducts, we see that aquaporins are inserted into these cells. And consequently, we see that a whole bunch more water can be reabsorbed in this part of our renal tubule and the collecting ducts. And consequently, we produce a very, very concentrated urine. Now, because this is a mechanism that can only occur when ADH is present with the insertions of aqua, insertion of aquaporins, we refer to this form of water reabsorption as facultative water reabsorption, which is different from the other form of water reabsorption that we called obligatory water reabsorption. Recall in the proximal convoluted tubule, we learn about water not being able to help itself and it has to follow all of the solutes. And so that there the water has no choice but to move by means of osmosis. And that we called obligatory water reabsorption. Here, the only time water can be reabsorbed is if we give it some help in the form of ADH and the binding of ADH allows for the building of aquaporins, which are, of course, our water channels needed to allow for water to move by osmosis. And so here we're comparing a nephron that is not exposed to ADH, and consequently the dilute filtrate formed in the distal convoluted tubule which is at an osmolality of 100, will remain at 100 because ADH is not present. On the other hand, if ADH is present, then we're going to see that this already dilute filtrate in the distal convoluted tubule can now lose more water because ADH will allow for the building of aquaporins in the distal convoluted tubule and even along the length of our collecting ducts. Therefore, we will see now that the filtrate will go from 100 in the distal convoluted tubule 
to all the way to possibly 1200, meaning the same osmolality as we see deep within the interstitium of the medulla. So we can actually produce an extremely concentrated urine as long as antidiuretic hormone is present. So I've been mentioning those juxtamedullary nephrons over and over again, reminding you that they have long loops of Henle that dip deep down into the medulla. And because of that, they can build that medullary gradient and therefore allow for us to produce a urine that can actually become very concentrated if ADH is present. Cortical nephrons, they do not contribute to the medullary gradient, even though 85% of the cortical nephrons, of the nephrons, I'm sorry, are cortical. Only about 15% of the nephrons are juxtamedullary. This is information I presented to you earlier on in the videos. But what we need to keep in mind is that the collecting ducts of all the different nephrons, both cortical as well as juxtamedullary, they collect the urine from all these nephrons. So a collecting duct is going to get urine that is isotonic because it's coming from the cortical nephrons, but it's also allowing for the urine that is very, very concentrated and made by the juxtamedullary nephrons perhaps, um, also to be collected. And so ultimately, what we see is that the urine that we dispose of, that we excrete, is a collection of all our nephrons. And because of that, we will still be able to excrete a very dilute ver versus a very concentrated urine. This then wraps up the urinary system chapter. What you really needed to get out of the last two videos is that in order for us to be able to make a more concentrated urine, we must first dilute the filtrate. And we do that at the level of the loop of Henle together with the vasa recta. To some extent, the, the, more, um, the deeper collecting ducts contribute to this as well because that's where these collecting ducts are permeable to urea and that urea can also help with building that very steep medullary gradient. Also, finally, to reiterate, to make a concentrated form of urine, we need antidiuretic hormone. Therefore, a patient who has damage to the posterior pituitary and therefore cannot secrete ADH, or uh, this patient can make ADH, but for some re reason the ADH cannot bind, or the ADH is not quite the most accurate structure to where it cannot bind. I mean, there are many reasons for why ADH might possibly not be able to impact the distal convoluted tubules and collecting ducts to concentrate the urine. And of course, consequently, patients like that are going to be excreting a very dilute urine and are very predisposed to dehydration. We refer to that condition, remember, as diabetes insipidus. We have talked about that before.